For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are, that no man should boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Our Father, we thank you that we were, when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, it was not our doing, but your doing that we are in Christ Jesus. Thank you that you initiated with us. You opened up our hearts and minds that we might understand the truth of the gospel to be able to make a decision. Thank you for your wondrous work in our salvation. And we have just sung of the earnest, the down payment that we have received through the Spirit of God who lives in us. Thank you that he is in us forever, that he has sealed us for the day of redemption, that Lord Jesus, when you come with that seal, the seal of the Spirit over our lives, you will in a moment's time, in the twinkling of an eye, catch us up to meet you, to be in the air with you, and to take us to the Father's house. We look forward to that incredible day that is in front of us. We know between now and then you have called us to be faithful servants, to preach the word, whether we do it as pastors or whether we do it as members. You've given that call to every believer, so help us today to pay close attention. Help me, fill me, use me. That together we might lift up Christ, we ask in his name. Amen. Would you take your Bibles and turn to Paul's second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2 this morning. And uh, Lord willing, next time in our next gathering together, we will begin a brand new book of the Bible, which is typically what we do when we go through chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But as I told you a few months back, there are a number of messages that I've been addressing that God has put on my heart. And so this morning, we want to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, God, by his grace, has used Community Bible Church for over four decades. But if you have studied the history of churches, many churches start out strong, on fire, passionate for the Lord. But within a short time, they begin to wane. And they're no longer useful to the master. The church at Ephesus that we've studied in our last two times together was such a church. They were passionate. They were doctrinally sound. But the second generation began to wane. Christ addressed them in the book of Revelation. Listen to these words. Speaking to the believers at Ephesus, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. And so we studied the history of this great church over these last few weeks. Paul started this church, preached the gospel, spent three years there longer than any other place in his entire life in ministry. There were people like Aquila and Priscilla who served alongside. There were great preachers like Apollos who preached in Ephesus. And Timothy, when he writes this letter, is serving as the pastor. But a generation went by and they began to drift. And so Jesus said this, but I have this against you that you have left, not lost, often misquoted this verse. There's a difference between lost and left. You've left your first love. The busy, doctrinally sound church, their hearts had cooled off. So Jesus says to them, therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. He doesn't ask them to conjure up some kind of feeling or emotion. He asks them to go back and do the first things. The things that they did as new believers, they studied the word, they hungered for the word, they shared the gospel, they lived separated lives. And he warns that if they would not do that, as with the other churches, that he might remove their lampstand. That is their ability to be a viable, usable witness 
to a lost world. And so then he will conclude the apostle John with these words, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Not to the church, but to the churches, because he's speaking not simply to the church at Ephesus, but to every church, and yes, the people of Community Bible Church. Now I want God to use this church. The title of the message is being used by God. And so we need to hear what Paul the Apostle has written by inspiration of the Spirit of God because as we move into the end of the age, Jesus said because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. In 2 Timothy, if you know it, it's a very moving epistle. He refers to Timothy in his first letter as his son in the faith. While he was an Old Testament believer, he heard about Yeshua through Paul and Paul won his family to genuine faith in the promised Messiah. And so he is addressing Timothy as a leader, but he's also addressing us because this morning he looks down the corridors of time to the end of the age, what we might refer to as the last of the last days. So with that in mind, follow along. We want to begin reading in verse 14, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself or prove to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Community Bible Church is the sum total of all of its members. And while there are many members in one body, your individual life and my individual life all brought together represents what this assembly is to be. And of course, I want my life, and I want your life, and I want this congregation to be useful to the master. Right out of the text, he speaks of those who are useful to the master, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes you will hear people say, well, God blesses a leader, and he blesses the people around him. That's a false statement. That's a half-truth. The Bible is clear that there are many, many leaders who are godly examples. Take Jeremiah and Ezekiel set apart leaders, but they had a congregation of rebels. No, God blesses what we are corporately. And so this message is not just for pastors, though he is addressing pastors in a very pointed way, but we'll see he extends the application to every blood-bought, born-again Christian. And so to help us to understand how God can use us, he gives us three illustrations of usefulness. The first illustration is that God will use an approved workman. God will use an approved workman. Look now, if you will, at verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Now, right off, I notice from this paragraph that there are two kinds of workers. On the one hand, there are those who are approved. The Greek adjective is a word that's used of metal that has been tested with fire. They would use this particular word, uh, dokimos, to test silver and gold and coins and, and to see if they were genuine. 
when you add the alpha prefix to it, as in Romans chapter 1, adikimos, he speaks of an adikimos, a depraved, reprobate mind, a mind that is corrupt, a mind that is disapproved, as some translations render it. God can give a person, God can give a nation, God can give, yes, even the world, an upside-down mind because they refuse to acknowledge God as God. And so the first group does not need to be ashamed, while the second group has every reason to be ashamed. And Paul is setting forth here two kinds of workers as he contrasts each worker and gives an example of both. The good workman accurately handles, literally, he cuts straight, the word of truth, versus the bad workman, as we'll see in verse 18, he's gone astray from the truth. And sadly, he is not accurately handling the word of truth. And so there's the good workman, the good worker, and it's generic, of course. You could say the good lady, the good man, the bad man, the good teenager, the bad teenager, in terms of their walk with the Lord, those who are approved and those who are not. So let's consider the workman that God approves. What makes someone an approved workman? Point A there in your outline. If you're new, there is an outline there in your bulletin and you can take some notes and you'll be glad you did, especially if you take some time and think about it and pray through the outline by the time we're done because there's coming a time when you and I, we will meet the Lord eyeball to eyeball and we'll give an account. You don't want to waste whatever time you have left. You may have blown it up till now, but today's the first day of the rest of your life. So first, the good workman is one who cuts straight. He cuts straight. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Now, those two words, accurately handling, is one word in the Greek New Testament. It's what theologues call a hapox legomena. It's a word that means used only once. And so with hopox legomenas, you cannot go to other verses and say, well, here's how the word is used over here or over here, maybe to shed some light on its meaning. But you have other options. You can step into first century Koine Greek to see how it was used in the era in which Paul lived, or on occasion, you can step into the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Remember, the Old Testament was written primarily in Hebrew, small number of chapters in Aramaic. But most Jews in Jesus' day did not read Hebrew. They read Greek, and so throughout the New Testament, primarily it's the Septuagint. You'll see it uh, very often abbreviated in your margin, if you have a Bible with marginal notes, is LXX, Roman numeral 70, because 70 men are said to have taken the Old Testament, the Tanakh, and translated it into Greek. So when you come into the Greek Old Testament, sometimes you can get a picture of the word. It's actually used in two instances in the Old Testament. In Proverbs 3 and verse 6, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. That's the word that is translated accurately handling, straightly handling. Or it's used in Proverbs 11 and verse 5, the righteousness of the blameless keeps his way straight but the wicked falls by his own wickedness. So Timothy is charged to cut straight the word of truth. The word is used outside of the Bible of a farmer who cuts a straight furrow, and it's also used of an engineer who cuts a straight road through the forest. And like a road or a path needs to be cut in a proper way so that you can reach the destination, even so, spiritually speaking, the word of God needs to be accurately cut handled, not swerving this way or that way, so that people can reach their spiritual maturity in Christ. And so Calvin quotes uh, in his commentary, John Chrysostom. John Chrysostom lived in the fourth century, and he rendered the verse this way, be diligent to present yourself uh, to God as a workman who does not need to be shamed, driving a straight furrow in your proclamation of the truth. And so that's what pastors are to do. They're to cut an accurate and plain furrow, rightly handling the word of truth. He's not to trim the message. He's not to add to the message. He is to shoot straight. He is to preach, as we studied in the last few weeks, the whole counsel of Scripture. He doesn't confuse men like Elamis the magician, who in Acts 13 is, was known for, malign, for making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. That's Elamis. Pastor is not to do that. 
nor does he want to please people with ear-tickling messages. He is to teach the whole word of God. In fact, this word, accurately handling, was repeatedly used by the early church fathers as a synonym for orthodoxy. Someone who is orthodox, who is true to the faith. And so a good pastor accurately handles, carefully exegetes the word of God. And the only way for a pastor to do that is to be diligent to study it. Now, if you're using the old King James, it says study to show yourself approved. The NAS and other translations say be diligent, which is right, they're both correct. There's not a single English word that will capture the original. He's speaking of study, but not just any kind of study. And so the NAS puts the emphasis on the kind of study. Be diligent. Look, many a Christian will have a quiet time, a devotional. And three hours later, if you can ask them what they studied or what they learned, they couldn't tell you if their life depended on it. They studied, but it wasn't a diligent study. So we are to leave our time from the presence of the Lord, having spent time earnestly studying the Word of God. And the preacher and teacher who will do that will be able to build God's church correctly. Paul said a pastor is not to adulterate the Word of God. And of course, there's coming today, 1 Corinthians 3, when a pastor's life will be tested. He warns that no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. And he says, if anyone builds upon the foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, A day is coming when his work will be evident. Now, he is speaking contextually of pastors. Now, we use it, and rightly so, and apply it broadly to Christians because the judgment of the just, called the bema, the judgment seat of Christ, is something that every Christian will stand at. 2 Corinthians 5.10, Romans 14.12. But he is reminding pastors, God is going to test the kind of ministry you have based on the tools that you use whether you used and implemented worldly wisdom as churches all across America are doing, and it's creating huge numbers of people but who are very worldly and for the most part lost, or whether a pastor rightly divides the word of truth and uses the word of God. And so an approved worker studies the scripture carefully. That's what a pastor is to do. You say, well, I guess this doesn't apply to me. Paul's talking about pastors. Well, you may not be a pastor teacher, as I am. God's called me into the ministry in 1978, and I'm a pastor teacher. You may not have the gift of teaching. That's one of the spiritual gifts. You may not fill the office of teacher, which James warns, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that you will incur a stricter judgment. But there's a sense, and we're going to see in a moment how Paul will extend this truth to every believer, But other passages of Scripture make it clear that there's a sense in which every Christian is to teach. Take the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples, converts of all peoples. Look, you're not discipling someone if you're not regularly sharing your faith. You're just filling their heads with knowledge. A true discipler models evangelism. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And that's why this verse has been rewritten by a number of organizations. Make converts, teaching them. That's the discipleship process after they're baptized. Baptize them, teaching them. So there's a sense in which the Christian, every Christian, he's not just speaking to 500 on that mountaintop, but to every Christian, because lo, I am with you always to the end of the age, in which we are to teach. Or take the writer to the Hebrews. He reminds us, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, some time had transpired, they should have grown up. But they hadn't. In fact, some of them had actually regressed. And by the way, anyone who says if you have this experience, you'll be catapulted into maturity are liars. That's not the New Testament. The New Testament teaches that it takes time to grow. For by this time you ought to be teachers. You have need again of someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. So the mark that you and I are growing Christians is that while we continue in the role of learner, and if anyone ever loses their humbleness where God can't show them something, they're in big trouble, you continue in the role of learner, but you move into the role of teacher. You're in a position where you can begin to answer basic questions. You can take people when they ask you a question to the Bible and basically say, thus saith the Lord. 
And so this passage has full application for us. Now, in addition to the workman who cuts straight, Paul gives us a different picture. He now reminds us of the bad workman who swerves. So there's the good workman who cuts straight, and then there's the bad workman who is one who swerves. Now, notice, if you will, what Paul tells Timothy in verse 16. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. So there were some people who had come into the Ephesian church whose teaching was just plain bad, and Timothy is exhorted to avoid it. He's already stated in verse 14 when we read the text, not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. This word ruin is the Greek word katastrophe. You can hear our word catastrophic. False teaching brings catastrophe into the church. Avoid worldly and empty charge. It, it will lead to further ungodliness. And then he adds, their talk will spread like gangrene. And so the damage that they bring is both godless and gangrious. It's like an infection in the body. And it can spread very quickly and ruin a congregation. In fact, literally verse 16 says that their teaching, in their teaching they advance into more and more ungodliness. In other words, they're going in a direction. They're just headed in the wrong direction. And their teaching spreads like gangrene. Once it has its foothold in the church, it can destroy a local assembly. And so their teaching is useless. It leads to the ruin of the hearers. J.B. Phillips, he lived in the 1950s, one of the first attempts to create a paraphrase translation. He lived in Britain, and he wrote the J.B. Phillips translation. He actually did a great job. He rendered it this way, for their teachings are dangerous as blood poisoning to the body and spread like sepsis from the wound. So like an infectious disease, people can be knocked off center such that they upset the faith of some. And those are the two tendencies of bad teachers, of false teachers, of heresies. They have an effect that is not healthy. It leads to catastrophe in the church, and it spreads very quickly like some kind of gangrious disease. And so he is warning them. Now, where did Paul learn all this? Of course, from the Lord. And if you were here last time, we studied from Matthew chapter 7 about those false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And so twice over, because Jesus wants you to know while they look Christian, while they walk Christian, while they smell Christian, they're not Christian. So twice over, he will say, so then you will know them by their fruits. And you need to pay attention. You may be 15 here this morning. You may be 13. There will come a day if the Lord takes me before the rapture, I will not be your pastor. And you need to be on your toes because people, as the book of Jude teaches, they sneak in unaware and they come in to destroy churches. And so as I told you last time, the analysis of their fruit is not always that straightforward and simple. Sometimes they're brand new Christians and they bring a lot of baggage with them into the kingdom of God and they're in that growing process and it takes time for fruit to mature. But sometimes while the fruit looks good, when you get up close and you examine it carefully, you discover that it's disease. Maybe there's a worm in it. And so when you apply this to the teacher in the church, what you need is not some superficial observation of what he says, but a careful scrutiny of what he teaches and what he believes. And of course, Paul learned this from the best. Remember what he said to the church at Galatia. He said in Galatians chapter 1, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's why he can say at the end of Galatians 1.16, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. That is to say, Paul didn't get his gospel from any human being. Ananias didn't give him the gospel. The apostles didn't give him the gospel. 
He got it directly there on the Damascus Road from a revelation through Jesus Christ. And so then he immediately adds in verse 17 of Galatians 1, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia, returned once more. Then he said, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. Now you learn in Acts chapter nine when Paul is converted for a short time after his conversion, he preaches the gospel in Damascus, but it's short-lived. And so the Jewish people who hated him, who saw him as a turncoat, sought to kill him. And so some of the believers put him in, it's a word for a large basket. They put him in a large basket and they lowered him over the city wall. Where does he go? For the next three years, he goes into the wilderness of Arabia. And so the disciples had a three-year seminary degree from the Lord. You know, we speak sometimes of seminaries. They were typically historically three years, and many came to that conclusion from the time Paul had or the disciples had. Uh, the best programs now are four years long because most people don't have any language study as maybe people did years ago. In either case, there was a deliberate compensation that the Lord gave to the Apostle Paul for three years out there in the desert. He may have had direct encounters with Christ because we see that illustrated on occasion in the Acts of the Apostles, but more likely, he was studying the scriptures and the Lord spoke to him. My point is, is that what Paul taught about false teachers, he learned from the best. He learned from studying scripture. And so we studied last week when Christ spoke about Pharisees, false teachers. They were like Roman Catholics or liberal Protestants who deny salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, based on, through Christ alone, based on scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. The five solas on the window behind us. Catholics and liberal Protestants have a different message not the message of salvation. Now there are Roman Catholics who are converted, and I thank God for that. I have a deep burden for Roman Catholics because that was my background from which I was saved. And we broadcast in six New England states every week because my burden is there, and we've seen literally hundreds of Roman Catholics come to Christ in the last 25 years, and I give God praise and thanks for that. But understand, Paul learned from the best. He learned from the Lord Jesus, and Jesus taught that the Pharisees revealed by their teaching, by their words, that they were false prophets. Because like liberal Protestants and Catholics, they taught that man could help save himself. But the scripture is clear. You have a righteousness that falls short of the glory of God. And so Jesus will say in Matthew 12, verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood, you nest of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. And so Jesus calls the religious leaders of his day basically sons of Satan. They're not associated with God. He, he incriminates them as being associated with the devil. They turned it over on him and they said he did his miracles in this chapter, not by God, but by the devil. And so they spoke evil of Jesus. And so Jesus said the good man out of his good treasure brings forth what is good and the evil man out of his evil treasure brings forth what is evil. The bad fruit of their words condemned them before the Lord. And it was a, a bad root in their heart. They were unbelievers. And I say to you that every careless word that men shall speak, they shall render account for in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. And so these Pharisees, by their words, were condemned. Doesn't mean that every Pharisee was lost and went to hell. Nicodemus was famously saved. And in Acts 15, you see some Pharisees who are converted. So but here's the point. Just as a tree is known by its fruit, even so a teacher is known by his teaching. And of course, false teaching is a tremendous dis disservice to people because it gives them a false sense that everything's fine and it doesn't lead them to heaven. It leads them to hell. Listen to what Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 13. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you, and gives you a sign or a wonder. And the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, 
Let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You should not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out if, you're, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments and listen to his voice and serve him and cling to them. So you've got these false prophets who do miracles, which unbelievers can do. Don't go after them if they're teaching things that are contrary. By the way, that's Bethel Church. That's the new apostolic reformation movement. You have men who claim to be apostles. You have men who claim to be prophets. Of course, most of their prophecies don't come true. Many of these men live sick, immoral lives, as has been documented in the last few years, as many have been exposed. It's a movement that has swept Western Europe, taken over conservative evangelical churches because someone was not watching. And by their own words, they're doing it through their music. Bethel music and Hillsong that snuggles up next to them. They're using the music as a platform to get into their hearts with doctrine. Of course, in Moses' day, if someone did this, the penalty was being stoned to death. They are in a theocracy. We don't live in that kind of a setting. But the principle applies, verse 5, but the prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. You shall purge the evil from among you. If you claim to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and your life hasn't changed, and your pastor says it's just fine, you are living under a false prophet because the grace of God that brings salvation teaches us the grace of God that brings salvation to all men because Christ made a provision all teaches us, that is those who believe, to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. If your life hasn't changed and you have a pastor who says it really doesn't matter, then you have a wolf in sheep's clothing. So sound doctrine and holy living are marks of true prophets. And truth matters. People say doctrine divides. Yes, it does. It divides truth from error, what is right from what is wrong. And sadly, because churches have not heeded the warnings that God is giving through the Apostle Paul, there is much moral and theological confusion in all these denominations that are going south. And it's like gangrene, it spreads very quickly. And Paul's not afraid to name people, Hymenaeus and Philetus. And so here in 2 Timothy 2, we read, and their talk will spread like gangrene among whom, among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. You've got to sometimes name these people. There's tender little lambs who don't know any better. And they turn on the TV and they think Joyce Myers and Beth Moore are wonderful. But that's the ignorance of our day. T.D. Jakes is wonderful. Kenneth Copeland is wonderful. Benny Hinn, they're one. These guys, these women are heretics. But people don't know the difference because they no longer know the scripture. Because the need to preach the word is being ignored and they've lost all discernment. Men, he says in verse 18, who have gone astray from the truth saying that the resurrection has already taken place and they upset the faith of some. You see that Greek verb, have gone astray? Here, again, he's describing a bad workman, but the illustration has changed. He is not using a word that would be used in civil engineering of a man cutting a straight road, but now he's using someone who's shooting in the realm of archery, an arrow, and the arrow has swerved off. In fact, the English Standard Version renders it having swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. The New English Bible paraphrases it, they have shot wide of the truth. And so Hymenaeus and Philetus were two such false teachers who had missed the target. They had swerved from what God had revealed. Have you met people like that? Look at verse 18. Men who have gone astray from the truth, saying the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. And so they're teaching the resurrection has already taken place. Now, obviously, people could look around and say, well, the resurrection hasn't taken place. So what do they mean? They do what most false teachers do. They spiritualize the text. 
They make it say what Scripture has not said. Maybe they use passages or concepts like in Romans 6 where spiritually speaking, we are identified with the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. When Christ died, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. When he was raised, we were raised. And Paul says because of that, because we're identified with Jesus, we can walk in newness of life. We can present ourselves as instruments to righteousness. Or maybe even what's brought here out in verse 11 of this chapter. For whatever reason, not specifically mentioned, these false teachers like prosperity theologians spiritualized the text and made the Bible mean something that it didn't mean. And typically, when you are erroneous on a major critical issue, there's all kinds of other false doctrine that will come alongside. And so when false teaching comes in, it is detrimental. I will meet people on occasion who will say, well, I listen to that guy, I kind of like him, and I, I eat the meat and I spit out the bones. No, you're living in disobedience. You're associating yourself with a false teacher. Naive people will follow your example, and they won't be able to spit out the bones. They'll choke on those spiritual bones, maybe to their eternal detriment. And so a denial of the physical resurrection, we had a church in Hilton Head a few years ago and the pastor said, well, you know, Jesus didn't literally rise from dead. He was raised up in our hearts. They use the same words, but with a different definition. I hope you know we have two Baptist churches in our town that deny biblical infallibility. We have two Presbyterian churches that do gay marriages. They have veered, swayed from the truth. The resurrection is no small doctrine. Paul will say, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection from the dead? His argument is because Christ was raised, we will be raised also. But again, we have these people who spiritualize the text. And while we don't know the specifics of Hymenaeus and Philetus, we know what they did was heretical. And so by swerving from the truth, these men whom he names, notice, have upset the fate, faith of some. They've brought catastrophe in the church. They have uh, shot at the target, but they've totally missed it. And so if a pastor is diligent to study the word of God, he'll be able to cut a straight road. He'll be able, like a skilled archer, to hit the target that God calls him to hit. But while they've upset the faith of some, verse 19, notice, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. God knows those who are part of his true church. Can a false teacher come in and and knock a true Christian off center? Yes, he can. He'll never deny his salvation. A true Christian can't. But he can knock knock him off center, to use Paul's words. He can upset the faith of some. And so he reminds us that God has a seal and an inscription on his people. One that is invisible and the other that is quite visible. Notice the first is secret and invisible and known only to God. The Lord knows those who are his. And since God knows those who are his... Those who are truly his are kept forever. And certainly there are those who, again, are knocked off center, but God recognizes his, his real people. It's a seal that's secret and invisible. But then there's a a second seal that's visible in public. Notice, everyone who abstains, everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain, aphistame, from wickedness. So while God sees the heart and knows those who are his, you can see the life. And that's a reliable evidence, according to the Apostle Paul and a number of epistles and the Lord Jesus, of whether or not someone really knows the Lord. Why? Because when you're born again, you have a desire to depart from iniquity. And if there's no desire to depart from iniquity, it just means you've never been born again. So having taught that God will use an approved workman in verses 14 through 19, now beginning in verse 20, he teaches that God will use a clean vessel. God will use a clean vessel. So let me read verses 20 through 22, and then we'll step through them carefully. He says, now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. <clears throat> 
Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So the picture Paul is painting is clear. Let's step through it. Verse 20 again. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, skuos, refers to an instrument, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If you go into someone's home, maybe you come into my home, there are some pots and pans that my kids would use when we'd camp out. We use them over the fire. There are some dishes that were basically everyday usage. But then we had some vessels that were somewhat sanctified, somewhat set apart. So when a guest came over or a friend came or it was a special occasion, we, we brought out the good dishes, so to speak. Now, if I can do that in my home, you can certainly do it in a stately mansion, which is what he's describing here. There are vessels of wood and earthenware, the everyday dishes, so to speak, which uh, are much cheaper, of course, and they're reserved for, quote, unquote, dishonor. You use them for the barbecue, but you don't use them on Thanksgiving. And so we might ask a question here, precisely, what is the Apostle Paul alluding to in this particular illustration? Well, clearly, the large house, contextually, is the church, the body of Christ. The Lord knows those who are his, the visible, professing church. But what are the vessels? Well, if you look carefully, again, it's not simply the members, but contextually, it's the leaders, the teachers, the pastors. In Acts chapter 9, Jesus appeared to Ananias and told him to go to the newly converted Saul of Tarsus. And he says, here's the reason, for he is a chosen vessel, a chosen instrument of mine, to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. It's the exact same Greek noun translated vessel or instrument in our passage. He was God's tool, God's vessel, God's person to carry the gospel of Christ before unbelievers. So there's two sets of vessels in a large stately mansion. Some that are phony and some that are highly valued. And again, he's applying it, go back to the nearest antecedent, to leaders in the church, to teachers in the church. He is contrasting authentic teachers from phonies like Hymenaeus and Philetus. Now, think your way through this because he's not going to restrict this simply to pastors. When you come to verse 21, he applies it to all of us. Therefore, if anyone, if anyone, that means you. You don't have to be a pastor to be an instrument of God. And if you stop and pause, it is a great privilege that God would reach down and put you in a situation where he uses you to impact some life and those important issues that someone can wrestle with. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, literally, if anyone cleanses himself from these, from these false vessels, from these false teachers who won't build you up, they will only tear you down. He will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, to the Lord Jesus, prepared for every good work. The King James says, if a man cleanses himself. Now it's generic, so he's not speaking simply of men. Now he's broadening it to everyone. You may be a teenager. You may be a young boy, a young woman. You may be a mom. You may be a dad. Anyone. Listen carefully. He elaborates with three illustrations. First, he says he'll be sanctified. It means he'll be set apart for a specific purpose. Second, he'll be useful. If he is surrendered, he will be useful for God Almighty to use him. And third, the text says he'll be prepared for what? For every good work. There's no higher honor than that. That you would be set apart, useful, that God might use you for his good. And so the master of the house who's sovereign over the church lays down just one condition 
for this to be true in a vessel's life, and that is he must be clean. And so Paul speaks of this cleanliness in two realms. Point A, there must be purity of doctrine. Purity of doctrine is essential to being usable for Christ. If Christ is going to use you, then you must be clean or pure in your doctrine. So notice specifically, if a man cleanses himself from these things, if we're to be useful to Christ, it's evident that there is some self-purification that must take place in your life. These things are simply these. You'll notice things are italicized in the NAS, meaning it's not a part of the original. It's there just to smooth it out. And it goes back to the nearest antecedent in verse 20, to the vessels of wood and earthenware, those that are for dishonorable use. Now, I know that... Um, that we can cut ourselves off sometimes from nominal Christians, and that's not what he's asking you to do. He's asking you to be careful about false teachers. Why? Because they won't build you up. They will not strengthen you. They will weaken you. And so he wants you to pay attention. And the context is clear. There's two kinds of vessels, two kinds of church leaders, two kinds of pastors, Honorable pastors, dishonorable pastors. But then if anyone, because this can apply to anyone, if anyone is willing to set himself apart for the purpose that the master has for him, he will be prepared for every good work. Augustine said this. He was right in this realm. Augustine, St. Augustine, as he's sometimes called, Catholics claim him. They put saint in front of him. Protestants claim him. They remove the word saint because they know that the Catholic Church means something different from saint than the Bible does. Augustine was a good guy overall. We'll meet him in heaven. But he had some serious problems. But he was right when he said, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. I wish he'd applied that to the Jewish people. He said some of the most hateful things about the Jewish people. It's embarrassing. In essentials, unity, and non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. And the apostle Paul would say, and in heresies, total separation. Now, it may not be politically correct to separate. So we had a movement in the 90s that I never stood by, never encouraged my men to go to promise keepers. It was a disaster because they compromised critical doctrines of orthodoxy, and they planted the seeds that have helped lead to the current day state of the church along with the whole seeker movement. And so there are some things that are non-essential you cannot compromise on. They are critical to the faith. And when you meet a teacher who says, well, it really doesn't matter, or it's not all that important. And sometimes they don't come out doctrinally, but you see their doctrinal error in their moral assessment of things. And so we have all these so-called evangelical churches that are acquiescing on critical moral issues. And so now they've redefined the LBTQIA. We removed family life from our radio station because they had Sam Alberry on there who teaches same-sex attraction Christians. That it's okay to embrace your same-sex attraction. It is not. That's wrong. You repent of it just like a heterosexual repents of his heterosexual lust. You're bringing under the sanctifying power of the Spirit of God. And so you don't mix moral error with moral purity, doctrinal error with doctrinal purity. Paul will say this to the church at Rome. Now, I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. And so purity of doctrine is essential to being usable for Christ. Secondly, purity of life. Purity of life is essential to being used for Christ. Purity of life. Now flee, he says in verse 22, flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So a useful human, a useful vessel must be holy. And again, he's contrasting him with the bad teacher, with the bad workman. So he says, everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. And so he exhorts us to flee youthful lusts and to pursue righteousness. 
Now the overall emphasis of scripture is that God uses a clean vessel. You can have sound doctrine, but if your heart is cloudy with compromise, then you won't be that clean, sharp vessel that God wants to make you and to use you. And so Paul in Romans 6 will remind us that we become a slave of the one to whom we present ourselves to, and that God wants us to be instruments or vessels of righteousness. God wants us to have in our life and ministry not just what he has declared of us positionally, but he wants us not just to have positional holiness, but practical holiness. And so negatively, he spells it out, flee youthful lusts. And the word here for flee is fuge, and it means to run from something to a safe place. Stephen uses it in that great discourse in Acts 7 of Moses who fled from Egypt in order to escape Pharaoh's wrath. In the New Testament, it's used in Matthew 2, 13, of Joseph and Mary who flee from the wrath of Herod the Great who wants to kill the Lord Jesus. And so this verb is also used of someone fleeing from spiritual danger. And that's important. You don't make peace with sin and say, well, I've always been this way. I guess I'm not going to change. That's to put yourself in a disastrous position. You don't linger in sin like Lot did in Sarm. You run from it as far away as you can, as Joseph ran from Potiphar's wife. However, Christian maturity is not simply measured by the things that you flee from. And some people assess their spirituality by the things they're not doing. He also speaks about the things that we should uh, flee towards. And so he uses a different word, pursue. And it's the exact opposite. The word flee means to run away. This word that's used, dioke, means to run towards. And so... He tells us specifically, much like he told the Philippians, he said, I've forgotten what lies ahead and I'm pursuing, I'm running towards knowing my Lord and becoming more and like him. And so here he tells us there are four things we are to be in hot pursuit of. Notice, righteousness, faith, love, and peace. And he makes it clear that we don't do this alone. We need other believers to do it with, like-minded believers, with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So this is a command to be in fellowship with God's people. And if you're listening to me today and you're not in the fellowship of a local church, then you're living in sin. You're living in disobedience. You know, I meet Christians sometimes who tell me, well, I left my church because they were compromised. Well, where are you going out? Well, nowhere. And many times, if the truth were known, it's not simply that their church compromised, but they compromise. Some pet sin they're clinging to. Some excuse they have now created so they don't need to do what God has called us to do. And so if we are balanced as a believer, there are things we flee from and there are things that we run towards. And so while we are isolated from the world, so to speak, and that you don't make yourself a friend of the world, though we're a friend of sinners, come out and be separate from them, saith the Lord, the same hand you are to pursue righteousness with God's people. And you see this all the way through scripture. We're to flee, we're to escape from that which is destructive, we're to run towards those things that will build us up. We're to deny ourselves. We're to follow Christ. We're to put off what belongs to the old life. We're to put on what belongs to the new life. We're to put to death our earthly members. We're to set our minds on the things that are above. We're to crucify the flesh in regards to its desires, and we are to walk by the Spirit of God. And so there is always this ruthless rejection of those things that God says we need to put behind us. And at the same time, there is this relentless pursuit with God's people to pursue these four qualities. That brings us to the final point. God will use an approved workman. God will use a clean vessel. God will use a true bond servant. God will use a true bond servant. Now again, let me read uh, verses 23 through 26 and then we'll step through it very, very carefully. Verse 23, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations knowing that they produce quarrels. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps 
God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So the illustration changes again. There's the approved workman, there's the clean vessel, Now there is the Lord's bond slave. And there are two unchanging truths about the Lord's bond slave that Paul wants us to grasp. First, the Lord's bond slave will teach what is right. He will teach what is right. He says very pointedly, he commands it in verse 23, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations knowing that they produce quarrels. So Timothy and every Christian is not to get caught up in foolish and ignorant speculations, debates, arguments. All they do is produce quarrels. And again, he's making a contrast between false teachers. You listen to most false teachers, and they've run down all these little side roads. And it's down these little side roads that they get people's attention. Oh, really? Is that going to happen? Oh, is that what the Bible says? And people bite on that carrot, but it's the devil's carrot. And so Paul, of course, was not afraid to engage in controversy. Just read his letters, his epistles, read the book of Acts, read Galatians on one occasion. He confronted the apostle Peter directly, publicly for hypocrisy. You can read of it in Galatians 2. But what is forbidden are speculations or controversies, issues that the Bible has not specifically addressed. That's what he's dealing with here. And there are many, a ministry that is built on sensationalism because it fills seats and they concentrate on sensationalism, on speculations, on controversies, and not in teaching the plain word. And so hold your finger here for just a moment and turn over just a couple pages to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Because he he tells us not simply what false teachers do, but what God's men are to do. And when you come to the uh, fourth chapter, he reminds us, look at verse 3. It begins with the word for. What's that in response to what he just said in verse 3? Preach the word, Timothy. Be in season, in season and out of season. For, here's the reason. The time is coming, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. You see that word sound? It's actually a medical term. You could say, a time will come when they will not endure healthy doctrine. Now he's speaking prophetically. The time will come. He's he's speaking to a time in the future. And ladies and gentlemen, may I announce to you that that day has come. But wanting to have their ears tickled. And it's a figure of speech that was common in the first century. Someone who wanted spicy little bits of information. There are people who like to go to church to have their ears tickled. And when you say what you want them to say and you say it in a way that they like, it's even better. And it's the opposite of sound doctrine. They will accumulate for themselves. In other words, now he's speaking of whole congregations. The congregation, you know, I deal with young pastors all the time who call me. Rarely does a week go by and it's kind of sad because some of these guys get out of seminary and they, they go to a church that calls them and they're just trying to do what's right. And they get all this kickback. And they're just trying to teach the scripture. It's because some of these churches have drifted for so long and finally a pastor comes in who opens up the scripture and preaches the truth and it's like hitting a brick wall. And I tell a lot of them, look, you know, you got one of two options. You can win a bunch of people to Christ where you basically overrule the old guard. Or in many instances, your better plan maybe is to start fresh and just go plant a church somewhere. But they, the congregation, will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths. Now back here in verse 24 of our text. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach patient when wrong. And Paul, again, is by application applying this to all of us. He's saying, Timothy, stick to the book. Preach the word. The things that you've heard from me as the chapter opens in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others. Be patient when you teach the truth because you're going to be maligned. 
That is going to happen. So the Lord's bondservant, number one, will teach what is right, but secondly, he will correct what is wrong. He'll correct what is wrong. The Lord's bondservant will correct what is wrong. Now sometimes our ministry is positive, and sometimes our ministry is negative. And Paul wants Timothy to know that how you say what you say is just as important as the content itself. Notice verse 25, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. It might be the false teacher, it might be someone who's influenced by the false teacher and they come into your church. With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. Now typically, we think of great men as anything but servants and anything but gentle. But in the New Testament, great men are servants and they are gentle. But what we have misunderstood is what servanthood is and what gentleness is. And sometimes the old English where it renders gentleness is meekness. And we associate meekness in our day with weakness. Actually, the word that is translated gentle was used of a a bronco who was wild and was brought under control. He was meeked. It's a picture of strength under power. Now, the greatest servant of all and the person who displayed more gentleness than anyone who's ever walked on the planet was the Lord Jesus. So lest you judge your pastor, think through what gentleness looks like. Here's a picture of gentleness. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money, money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them, all of them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away and stop making my father's house a place of business. He did that at the beginning of his ministry, as John records, as I just read. And he did it at the end of his ministry, the last week of his life before he's crucified as the synoptics record. That's not weakness. That's great strength. Flipping over tables, taking a scourge, dumping over their money, driving out the animals. He was consumed with zeal. And so if we're gentle, we confront with great power those who oppose the truth. Why? Perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will. So on the one hand, these false teachers are lost and they need to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, I prayed in my prayer closet for Benny Hinn and Joel Steen and T.D. Jakes in some of these Kenneth Copelands of the world, and the Joyce Myers. I've prayed for them. Why? Because they're entangled by the snare of the devil. Perhaps, maybe, they could come to their senses. So on the one hand, these false teachers are lost, and they need to come to the knowledge of the truth. On the other hand, the Scripture teaches that their lostness is symptomatic of what the devil is doing. They are in the snare of the devil. They're trapped by him. Paul will say this to the Corinthians. The God of this age, the devil, has blinded their minds, the minds of unbelievers, so that they cannot see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. The devil blinds men. And so with harness power, with truth that is controlled, you confront it head on. That they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been head, held captive by him to do his, his will. Look, this is the spiritual battle we're in. It is a spiritual battle and it is raging like never before here at the end of the age. And that's why before you talk to men about Christ. You need to talk to Christ about men. I had a day off recently, and I went to the beach with my wife, and I said, look at those guys. They can hardly stand. They're blasted. Beer after beer, they had a large bottle of tequila, and they're passing it around. And I said, I, I wish I could share the gospel with them. And I couldn't sit any longer. I just needed to get up and stretch my legs and I walked by them and they stopped me. Hey, come here. 
I said, what's up, man? My friend, he's, get, he's getting married. You got any advice for him? I said, well, um, I said, I've been married for 43 years, and I'm still married to the same woman by God's grace. And I said, if this is you, and this is your coming wife, and the Lord is at the top of the triangle as you move towards the Lord, you'll, you'll grow closer to each other. And I said, you could have that. He said, oh, I'm a Christian. I said, well, I'm not your judge, but I quoted Galatians 5. I quoted 1 Corinthians 6, that people who practice drunkenness have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. I'm not your judge, but I'll tell you what the scripture says. And so we talked, and these guys are actually very open. They're asking all kinds of questions about what it meant to be a Christian. I said, look, the scripture doesn't speak of perfection, but it speaks of a new direction. And what you're doing is typically what happens with your generation all across America every weekend. I said, the biggest problem that you have is what's in your hand. I said, the number one cause of marital breakup is adultery. And in my view, the number one cause of adultery is liquor. Because when people get inebriated, they will do things that they thought they would never do before. Look, there are people who are in the snare of the devil. And let me speak for a moment to some of the parents and grandparents. I was just reminded this past week when I get all kinds of calls, and if I can call someone, I'll I'll do it on my way home from work because it's a 20-minute drive, and this lady is in the Midwest, and She's got a grandson. She said, Pastor Crow, I listen to you. We love Community Bible Church. And I, don't know. I have a grandson. He's just a young man. He's thinking about changing his gender. And she was just heartbroken. And let me just say, we have these gay parades all across America. And yes, we have one coming to Port Royal on November the 18th, the day of our men's conference. And they can legally do what they do, though they can't legally do it next to that playground in Port Royal. Not according to South Carolina law, so we'll see what the officials of Port Royal do. But you know, they chant, we're here, we're queer, we're coming after your children. That's not tongue in cheek. That's reality. Right now in America, there's over, reported last week, over 1,000 school districts that have policies that prevent parents from knowing if their children are thinking about changing their gender. And in some schools, they start as early as kindergarten that you may not be the gender of your birth. As early as kindergarten in some schools, they're using preferred pronouns before these kids even know the alphabet and some are struggling with tying their shoes. And neither can you trust the local library anymore because the American Library Association appointed a Marxist lesbian who's now their new president and it's fleshing itself out in libraries all across America. Neither can you trust Hallmark anymore because they got men kissing men and women kissing women. And in your local library and community, you have these drag queen story hours. They're coming for your children. But I told this dear woman, I said, look, your grandson is caught by the snare of the devil. And it's a spiritual battle And you need to pray for him because only the Lord can deliver him. He can come to his senses and escape from the snare of the devil. But right now he's captured to do the devil's will. God uses a pastor who's able to teach, apt to teach, or skillfully, you could render it, skillfully teach. Without being quarrelsome, he has strength under power. And he uses people like that. So how are we gonna apply this? Let me make three applications as we close our time. Number one, the Christian who is used by God knows the word. He knows the word. If you know Christ this morning as your Lord and Savior, you are, according to scripture, a member of the beloved of God and you are beloved by God. So there's both an adjective and a verb that is descriptive of a true believer. 
What that means, among other things, is you can't do anything to make God love you any more, and you can't do anything to make God love you any less. He loves you, according to John 17, as much as he loves his own son. But because you are in Christ with his righteousness and loved eternally and unconditionally, just because you are beloved of God doesn't mean you're approved of God. There's a lot of beloved believers, but not approved believers. Now think your way through this. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. No one in any age has ever become a believer apart from the word of God. Even before the scripture was written, at different times in different places, God used visions and dreams. Now it's codified. He uses the scripture. You've been born not of imperishable seed like in your physical birth, but you're born of imperishable seed through the living and abiding word of God. And so the scripture teaches God used the word to convert you. And if you don't know the word, you won't be an instrument, a vessel in God's hand by which you can introduce people to the Lord. And not only does the spirit of God use the word of God to bring about spiritual birth, the spirit of God uses the word of God to bring about spiritual growth. And so we ignore what Jesus said. Quoting Moses, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And so these food terms, milk, 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 meat, honey, bread, describes what the scripture is like. And so like newborn babes, we're to long for the pure milk of the word so we can grow in respect to our salvation. It's why Jesus said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So if the spirit of God uses the word of God to save us, if the spirit of God uses the word of God to grow us, and you don't know the word of God, then your usability is really nothing. This is why it is important that you do not have a casual relationship to Scripture. Secondly, the Christian who is used by God lives holy. He lives holy. Only if we cut the truth and do straight and don't swerve from it will we be approved by God. But not only are we to cut the truth straight, we are to do it from a clean life if we are to be used by God. And the scripture teaches that the spirit of God takes the word of God and he communicates it through a clean heart. Not a perfect life, but someone who is in fellowship with the Lord. C.T. Studd, the great missionary that shook Africa for Christ, said the world has yet to see what God will do through a man completely yielded to him. D.L. Moody, and Moody was older than Stud, but they lived during some of the same time frame, and Moody read that, and he said, God, let me be that man. And I would say the world is yet to see a church. What God can do through a church that is completely yielded to him. Lord, let us be that church. Finally, the Christian who is used by God majors on the majors. The useful servant of God is not caught up in speculations about issues and events that God hasn't addressed. He majors on the majors. He hammers the basics. I meet Christians who are trying to figure out which of the ten toes, what nations they represent in Daniel's vision. We don't know. But I will tell you this, our discovery class it's called Basic Discipleship at searchthescripture.org for people live streaming. It's like the nuts and bolts of the Christian life. And I dare say most people don't really understand it. And I will often tell young men, I said, if you really understand the discovery class, what is taught there, and you internalize it and you apply it, you will be an instrument in the hand of the master approved by him to be used for his honor and his glory. Now, our Holy Father, I thank you for the time we've had today to dig into your word. And as I've been preaching, I know the Spirit of God has been speaking as he uniquely does to each and every heart. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your personalized direction and care. And I pray that you would guard this fellowship of believers that should you put another pastor in my shoes in this pulpit, that senior pastor would be faithful and true to the word of God and steer this congregation of sheep until Jesus comes.
Now, Father, we can't deal with everyone, but we can deal with our own lives. So examine us today and lead us in the everlasting way, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? We'll sing a hymn of invitation. Maybe you're here this morning and you've received Jesus. You've never made it public. That's a first step. If you're not ashamed to go public, I won't be ashamed to baptize you. You say, well, pastor, I've been saved and I've been baptized. Well, you need a church home. And if not here, go somewhere, but don't float. So if you have a decision you need to make this morning, I want to invite you as Matt leads us. Step out now.